Before we can expect to write useful programs, we have to be able to expect to write working programs. And we can't really expect our programs to work until we can debug them. And to debug them, we probably need to get a handle on the strange way that output gets generated in C++. It's especially strange if you compare it to what you might do in C, where you might recall you'd use printf. And the printf function is something that everybody gets used to when they write C code, but it is a little bit annoying. It's a bit high maintenance. And there are lots of ways when you write printf statements where if you make some small mistake, it can make a real mess that's pretty hard to debug. And in that sense, the weird C++ out output convention isn't so bad. On the other hand, it still takes a little bit of getting used to. So we'll talk about that in this video. And uh, I also want to begin broaching the subject of how we work with data. And it turns out, in fact, that almost everything that you know from basic uh, control flow syntax in C ports over perfectly to C++. You can declare variables, they have the same types, although there might be some reasons you want to use different syntax to do it, you actually are allowed to use C-style syntax um, in much the same way you would in C. So a lot of that, uh, those C skills do transfer to C++. So the goal of this small program is going to be, I want to create two variables, then I want to print them out. So that, of course, later when I'm debugging programs that are useful, I know how to print out the data that I'm working with. So task one, I want to make two variables. I want to make a variable called i and a variable called g, and I want to set them to the initial values that are shown. And it turns out that to do this, I would do exactly the same thing I would do in the C language. So I could write int i equals 6, and I could write double g equals 1.87. And there we go. We now have our two variables. Um, I want to put a bookmark here, though, for later, because I want to observe this is a C-style initialization. So I'm creating a new variable of type int, and I'm setting it equal to 6 as its initial value. That's all good, and you're allowed to do this. This is called C-style initialization because it's probably what you remember from writing C code. It turns out, as we're going to see in a couple of videos, there is a more modern alternative that we really, really should get into the habit of using. Although I don't blame you if you don't want to do that so soon. So for now, we'll suffice to do this. Int i equals 6, double g equals 1.87. Uh, and you might want to review from your previous programming course how you work when you're tracing through code, how you work on keeping track of the values of variables. That is a very useful thing to review. We're going to need to trace through code in this course as well, um, but I'll leave it to you to do that review because it depends on what technique you would rather use. For this program, it shouldn't be necessary to keep track of very much at all because we're only doing a few short tasks. So task number two. Print out the message, the value of i is, and then give the value of i, and a new line. Um, and it says that it should do all of this stuff, print out this, uh, print the value of i, print out a new line, in one statement. I want to write one line of code that does this, just to demonstrate the typical way we would generate output in C++. And so it looked like this. So in the previous video, I didn't want to go into too many details about this thing. This, uh, I pronounce this std colon colon c out. And there is a pretty substantial school of thought that when we see this token here, they want to pronounce that like a word. I don't know how to pronounce words that don't have vowels, and so I just spell it out. std colon colon. std colon colon c out. What we'll notice in C++ is that this prefix tends to come before just about everything in the standard library. It is an easy way of knowing when you're looking at some thing you're working with in code that it actually came from the standard library. You could almost think of std as being the folder in which all the standard library stuff has been stored. Now that's a simplification. Eight or nine weeks from now, we'll unpack further what I really mean by that. Um, but it turns out that when you see std colon colon, you are probably working with something that is part of the C++ standard library. Now, C out um, is the standard output stream. So wherever the program's normal output is supposed to go, that is where C out refers. Uh, and so usually we, we think of this as being the screen. We're communicating with the user. Similarly, there is a standard input stream, which is normally the user's keyboard input. Okay, so SED C out is an object there's an odd word to use, an object that represents the standard place where output goes. And what I want to do is I want to send some output to the user. I want to send some output to my standard output stream. And I use this strange operator for it. One thing we're going to notice in C++ is that operators suddenly get used for all sorts of strange things they wouldn't have been used for 
it previously in, for example, a C program. In a C program, if you have different functionality, you'd write a bunch of functions for it. Whereas in C++, we're going to notice that a lot of different data works instead with strange looking operators. Now this operator in particular, we usually refer to this as stream insertion when we're generating output. And the visual metaphor this is meant to uh, imply is that if I have some text here, there's some text. If I have some text, what I'm sort of doing is taking this text and pushing it into my output stream. So I'm pushing it in and then it comes out of the output stream and the user can see it. And of course, if I want to push multiple things into my output stream, they all go in in order. That was the metaphor behind the invention of this operator here. And we'll notice this language gives us tons of flexibility to be creative in how we view our data. And that's one of the reasons maybe this ran away from the language designers a little bit that they came up with this idea of pushing output into the output stream. So what I want to push in there is the text, the value of i is, and then a space. And then I'm going to push more data. I'm going to push it all in one statement. I'm going to push the value of i, and then I'm going to push a new line. And we saw in the previous video, this strange token here is what we prefer to use to end the line instead of just writing backslash n. And you're just going to have to take my word for that for now. It is one of these C++ conventions that you'll notice is so pervasive that it's better to abide by it so that we can get along, at least for the time being, than to worry exactly why we use it. Turns out there is actually a good reason, but it's hard to justify until we know a little bit more. Okay, so uh, this has all been done in one statement, and uh, as per good practice, I really ought to compile and run my program as often as possible. Because if there's a bug, it's much easier to find my bug if I compiled successfully in the recent past. So we'll try compiling this. G++, um, turn on all warnings, and then we're going to use the, just like in the previous video, uh, C++20, the 2020 C++ standard. I keep pointing that out because if you Google um, advice on writing C++, you will notice that the style of C++ code has evolved a huge amount over time. And if you're not careful and you get advice from people that are writing old-fashioned looking C++, your life will get a hell of a lot harder. Um, and so I often use the term modern C++ to refer to what I write in this course. Usually the word modern C++ refers to post-2011 era C++. And a lot of things changed in the language in 2011. That's one reason to be very careful when you go looking for C++ advice that you're getting maybe C++ 20 or C++ 17 advice. Uh, okay, so then I'll create, this is called numeric output. Uh, and we can see there the compiler is generating a warning for us. We know, of course, that this particular warning is harmless. Having an unused variable is no big deal, especially because I, I simply haven't gotten around to that part of the program yet. All right, numeric output. The value of i is 6. And we'll notice that there was a new line because the prompt is generated on the next line. So the program did end with a new line after the last line of output. So all is good so far. Uh, and the idea here is, and you'll notice that you get into a habit pretty quickly of doing this, although it is a bit verbose, that when you want to generate output, what you usually do is um, use your C out stream and then a series of these operations to push data into it. I generally like, unless the line of text is incredibly long, to try and put one whole line of text into each statement. But you're not required to do that. There's no requirement that you push end L at any time at all. Um, you could also, as we're going to do in task three, push each piece of output separately. So here this says print out the value of G, um, but do this with separate statements for each thing. Separate statement for the value of G is, um, a separate statement to print the value of G itself, and then a separate statement for the new line. And so I can do that by just pushing output one piece at a time. So the value of G is, and then I stop. And then a minute later, I push the next thing, which is the value of G. And then a minute later, I push the next thing, which is my end of line. So we'll try saving that, and we'll take a look at what happens if I run it. And we can see there it is, the value of g is 1.87. So for the sake of this video, hopefully I've proven the point that we do now have the ability to generate whatever output we want. It might be more cumbersome, your mileage may vary. I really like printf, so that's one reason I'm a bit um, less fond of this more verbose format, but maybe it's a bit more convenient. There's no worrying about percent %d or percent %f or anything. There is one thing lurking beneath the surface here that you ought to think a little bit about, which is unlike printf, and unlike perhaps whatever analog you had in whatever previous language you learned, if it wasn't C, 
you might notice that the type of i and the type of g are distinct. i is an int, g is a double. And yet, when I want to print them out, I just push them right into my output stream. So here I'm printing out i, here I'm printing out g. Notice that unlike with printf, I don't need to do anything special. Somehow, when I push i into c out, or when I push g into c out, it figures out what I'm trying to print, and then it goes and prints it, almost like magic. And we'll notice in C++ that its language is full of these things, cases especially when types are concerned, where the features of the language are able to read into what we're doing using the types that we're using without us having to tell it. So unlike with printf, we don't have to write percent %f or percent %d. It just figures it out. And that is one of the underlying aspects of C++ that will turn out to be quite complicated and the source of a lot of material later in the course. The um, much greater role that types play in the language. But for now, we know how to generate output, so we can begin writing programs that are useful and debugging them. On the same topic, though, we should talk a little bit about input. So maybe we should extend this metaphor that when I would like to generate output, I push the output into my output stream. I push it out to the user into this thing C out. Well, it turns out the reason, one of the reasons they designed this metaphor was because they wanted something more symmetric. They wanted the ability to push output to the user, to see out, to the screen, or wherever the output is going, and to pull input from the user. And so I have an example of that as well. Um, so here, let's just try and read some basic input. I'm going to create two variables again. I'm going to use C style initialization. So I make a variable called i. We'll set that to 0. Um, I'm going to again make a note this is C style initialization. Uh, and that's not ideal. Uh, again, it's good to build a habit of using the modern C++ style initialization, but until we know what that is, we'll be fine with this. Uh, double G equals zero. And now I print to the user, enter an integer. And what I want to show off here is this metaphor of using the strange arrow operator to push data in, although it's odd, although it, it's big thinking, but maybe, you know, a bit of style without substance, there was some logic behind it. So C out refers to the normal destination of the standard output. So again, typically the screen, the user, whatever the user is reading. There is a, uh, symmetrically something called C in which is the standard source of input. Normally the standard source of input, we can think of it as the keyboard, wherever the user enters the input when the program is actually running. So here I ask the user to enter an integer, and now I'm going to pull an integer in from C in. Notice I use this arrow here. I pull the data out of C in into my variable i. Uh, and then similarly down here, I want to enter a real number, so I'm going to pull some data from C in into g. Uh, which is a double. And again, notice that I never tell it what the type of i is or the type of g. Somehow it's able to figure that out, or I assume it is. We better make sure it works before I make a claim like that. Um, so we'll compile this. This one's called numeric input. I guess we'll clear the output here. So I type numeric input and it says enter an integer. Uh, well, I already did six, so I guess we'll try 10. Enter a real number. And then I'll do, I don't know, 18.7. Uh, and I'm going to press enter in a second. But notice that once I'm done, the program will try to print out the value of i and the value of g. So I'm going to press enter. And we notice i contains 10, g contains 18.7. And so it was able to read the data from me, figure out what the type was supposed to be, and then store it accordingly. And so that's one more place where it's clear that there's some deeper magic to how types are being handled than there would be in C, much less, of course, what exactly is going on with this strange operator. We'll notice all through the course, there are a lot of places where there is some behind the scenes wizardry happening with types types that would never be possible in C. And even if you come from a language that isn't C, you'll notice that C++ has an incredibly sophisticated way of handling types. And many of the advanced features that we end up working with that are so convenient to us, in fact, are just clever ways of using this incredibly powerful typing system.